Paul Hogan is a business development lead for ESB eCars. Paul is a chartered engineer with a background in design engineering and has worked with ESB for the last 16 years. He is currently responsible for sourcing and securing new locations for ESB eCars growing EV charging network in both Ireland and in the UK. Tonight, we'll be discussing the rise of EV charging infrastructure in Ireland, the journey so far, and what the future holds for transport electrification in Ireland. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Ian, um, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, firstly, thank you to the Northwest Division of Engineers Ireland for accommodating me to present. Um, I'm really pleased to, to have the opportunity to present to you. And uh, as, as Ian said, please feel free to drop questions into the Q&A box um, and we can discuss them at the end. I'm really keen to, to uh, open up the discussion with the panel. So as Ian said, uh, the topic for tonight's presentation is on EV charging infrastructure in Ireland, uh, the current status of the sector, this emerging sector, sub sector, let's say, of the energy sector, and where we're going with it. Um, little bit just in terms of the agenda, I'll just give a quick introduction to myself um, on top of Ian's. We'll then just talk about electrification of transport and why electrification is a priority uh, for, for ESB when it comes to transport. Um, we'll talk about maybe the, the early years of the transport, the transport electrification journey, the EV journey from 2007 to 2017, and then some of the more recent uh, gear shifts of, of, of how the industry has started to really take off. Um, and then we'll have a little uh, look at what we maybe see the road ahead looking like from 2024 and into the future. So about myself first, um, the, uh, I suppose the, the background uh, for me, I'm, I'm a chartered mechanical engineer. I've been with ESB for just over 16 years now. Um, I joined ESB as a mechanical engineer out of DIT. Um, and I spent the first 10, 11 years of my career with ESB working as a design engineer and, and project manager. Um, in 2018, 2017, I, I made the transition away from uh, power generation part of ESB into the uh, public EV charging business, which at the time was um, uh, emerging to be a, a really commercially active part of ESB. Um, I've gotten into EV very much so, uh, both professionally and personally. Uh, we have two EVs at home, and uh, I, I like to think my, of myself as a little bit of an EV geek. Um, I can't drive past a charge point without it turning my head, wanting to know whose it is and what brand it is. Um, so uh, I suppose that's that's uh, it, it's become more than just a job. Um, so just moving on um, briefly about ESB and kind of what what's driving us to uh, focus on transport electrification. It's really founded in our, our core strategy um, and our, uh, our focus on driving a dif the difference in terms of making positive change uh, to society and overcoming the challenges, uh, most significant being climate change. So I'll just briefly play a, an overview video for ESB and our brighter future strategy. Almost 100 years ago, Ireland made an investment in ESB. Since then, we've invested in Ireland, building the critical energy infrastructure we need to live, work, teach, save lives, and compete on the world stage, repaying the investment made in us by the people of Ireland. Over the past decade, we have contributed more than 1 billion euro in dividends to the Irish Exchequer. And we invest more than 1 billion euro a year to make Ireland's energy system more reliable, efficient, and sustainable. Because we are, and always have been, invested in Ireland. So, oh. the core strategy for ESB, um, driven to make a difference, is really centered around uh, net zero uh, 2040 strategy. Um, and essentially that sets out a really clear roadmap for ESB to achieve net zero emissions by 2040. It commits ESB to science-based targets and provides us with the targets for decarbonizing our operations. 
it sets out a pathway to achieve that net zero by 2040 uh, approach. And it gets into the detail as you work your way down through the strategy from that top headline target. Um, but it's underpinned by three key objectives at the core, um, which are to decarbonize electricity and develop the renewables and infrastructure necessary to achieve the net zero target. The resilient infrastructure that's necessary to provide resilient uh, capacity um, to our networks to provide that low carbon energy and supply that low carbon energy to our, our customers, and then to empower the customers themselves to really enable them to be part of that net, net zero journey. Um, and I suppose the net zero strategy then uh, within itself captures key areas of, of how our business is, is, is moving forward with the transport electrification pillar being, being part of it. So our role in, in transport electrification in ESB is, is multifaceted and it's spread across different parts of ESB group. So if I was to just look at kind of the, the three core divisions of ESB and how we have different activities in the electrification of transport space. So our colleagues in ESB networks, their focus is really on grid reinforcement, innovation, and on the rollout of smart meters at mass, um, which is really set around the target of having 2.4 million smart meters and uh, sorry, 2.4 million smart meters by 2026 and 2.6 by 2030. My colleagues in Electric Ireland, their focus is on the development of home products and solutions for EV drivers. So when it comes to the EV driver and the transport electrification drive, 90, 80, 80 to 90% 90 of, of EV charging is done at home at present. So therefore, the home products for energy are, are key to that. And the integration of those smart meters that are being rolled out on an ongoing basis by our colleagues in ESP networks um, is critical also. But I suppose where, where I'm going to be focusing this evening is on the public charging infrastructure. Um, so I work in the public charging part of, of ESB. Um, and our core focus under the Net Zero strategy is to build a bigger and better public charging network, build on what we've built to date, and increase the number of public charge points to 3,000 um, by 2030. And in, that will include a large proportion of high powered charging capacity across both the UK and Ireland. Um, we also have our energy solutions division who are providing solutions to fleets and businesses and large energy users who also have a transport electrification mandate looking at fleet users, workplaces um, and, and other equivalent entities that need charging solutions. So moving on, why is electrification uh, of transport a, a key uh, focus for, for the, the broader strategy? I suppose from a, a basic principles perspective, the core driver is the climate uh, crisis that we're, we're all facing and every industry uh, bar none um, is, is in some way feeling the pinch associated with the climate crisis. Um, from a practical perspective, obviously 3.3 3 to 3.6 billion people uh, global, globally are, are at risk as a result of the direct impact of climate change. Um, but additionally, you've got you know a huge proportion of people who are at risk of poor air quality, and essentially, you know, the, there's attributable deaths even in Ireland to poor air quality. I suppose why would you want to try and electrify transport? Um, if we're talking about trying to decarbonize the energy systems, um, why does it seem like a good idea to try and shift people to electrification of transport? Well, I always use the double whammy analogy. If you can drive people into EVs and if at the same time you can decarbonize the energy sector, and additionally start to view the transport electrified the electrified elements of transport as actually an asset that you can use as part of that energy system then you can reap significant benefits from going that direction obviously there's still a huge amount of distance to cover in terms of the 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 full implementation of electrification transport in tandem with uh, the electric, the, the the renewable introduction to energy, the, the energy system and transition of that energy system to a more renewable base, but ultimately those battles have to be fought at tandem, um, and obviously as well at the same time there's the electrification of residential heating, the move towards heat pumps, and essentially an electrified uh, focus across multiple sectors. Just considering the the uh, the nature of the crisis, many people don't realize that in the, uh, the late 1900s, 1894 to be specific, there was a crisis known as the Great Horse Manure Crisis of 1894. 
um, essentially, I don't have to explain this too too uh, too visually beyond the pictures, but essentially they had reached a point where the horse manure issue in major cities across the developed world were uh, a major health crisis um, and were becoming unmanageable. And it was through a, a very fast paced change in a 20 year period that we saw the rise of the uh, the first automobile um, to solve the problem and clean up the streets of, in this case, San Francisco, which saw a drastic change and the introduction of the horseless car. So we're probably on the cusp of the same sort of necessity being the mother of invention um, going forward for transport. So let's just talk briefly about maybe where things have, have come from. Um, all too often we get hung up on the pathway forward and what, you know, are we moving quickly enough to do enough right now? But I suppose it's good to understand the journey to, to where we are now uh, to date. Um, in Ireland, um, we've been at the center of electrification and transport for longer than people realize. Um, so through the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, ESB was actually in the background um, plotting <laughs> a, a plan towards electrification of transport. We had a number of vans across the ESB networks uh, and, and the ESB uh, business fleet um, that were uh, proof of concept um, over the years, but always, always very much you know, keeping an open mind to the innovation of moving towards electrification of transport. I suppose it took until the early 2000s before it started to become something that people were genuinely considering as a, as a pathway forward. It was still very much out there. But in 2009, a tripartite agreement was reached between the Irish government, ESB, and a number of car manufacturers, the main ones being Nissan and Mitsubishi, who were in the process of trying to go commercial with their first Mitsubishi IMEVs and Nissan Leafs, the first generation Nissan Leaf. Um, and that tripartite agreement was for ESB to lead a pilot project, the eCars pilot project, to roll out charging infrastructure across the island of Ireland ambitiously investing in a, a network of infrastructure that would only be usable for a very small number of very, very early adopters. Um, the pilot was rolled out over the course of a five-year period from 2009 until 2014. Um, those charge points rolled out nationwide, primarily along main arterial routes, um, but really to try and achieve significant coverage. Um, and through the period 2014 to 2016, Ireland got its first fast charge points as well as the technology started to advance and vehicles started to be able to take a faster charge. Um, so by 2017, we had the world's first cross-border interoperable EV charging network. Um, we had 150 kilowatt fast chargers and we had over a thousand, approximately 1,022 kilowatt standard chargers. Um, and we, we essentially had uh, the capacity to provide public EV charging in almost every community with greater than 1,500 people. We also, as part of the pilot project, rolled out uh, more than 3,000 home charge points as part of that, uh, that arrangement with the, the likes of Nissan and, and Mitsubishi. Uh, so people who were early adopters were being supported with a, a, an overall solution. And we also undertook a, a, a broad range of technical studies uh, and research and development in more advanced areas and, and areas that were, that were uh, up and coming. We essentially uh, piloted almost every form of charge point, charging standard. We were involved in the development of what is now known as the open charge protocol, which is the system for communications between the different charging infrastructure, charge to charge points and, and back end systems. Essentially early industrial internet of things um, for networks of hardware disparately spread across an entire island. Um, but I suppose the, the, the key point here is that that network grew over, over a period of 10 years. It was a pilot. It was very much proof of concept. It, the infrastructure was all free to use for those early, early adopters. Um, but we hadn't reached a tipping point. We didn't really have a market um, and it hadn't had the, flitch, the switch hadn't flicked yet. In uh, 2018, we started to see uh, a shift. Um, we started to see particularly in 2017, a pivotal tipping point reached. The Really the first tipping point, uh, the, the major accelerant on, on the change was the VW emission scandal. Um, I don't need to go into the detail, but essentially it, it painted 
um, a, no, a number of, of entities in the traditional market in a poor light. And it really did uh, cast a question mark over the uh, the, the stand, standards and status in the production of automobile uh, automobiles um, EV or non non EV ICE and uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, at the same time, there was uh, I suppose the bigger picture, the geopolitical escalation of the climate change agenda. Um, was really kicking off. We were seeing maybe um, the the roots of disconnect between uh, the Paris Climate Accord and maybe the views of the recently elected Donald Trump in the U US. But then at the same time, the market on the vehicle side was starting to kick off. So we started to see the uh, the first of the Tesla Model 3s come to the market, the first affo relatively affordable EV from Tesla compared to their, their earlier Model S. The likes of Hyundai and Kia starting to enter the European markets with their their now EVs, and they're offering an EV option with those two vehicles from the off. And at the same time, with some of the visionary country, countries like uh, like Norway, who are starting to get a jump on the concept and offering really strong incentives for people to go electric. In the subsequent years, uh, some specific events solidified the electrification that electrification would be the path way forward in particular um you know that the shift politically um from the point of view of most nations starting to center themselves around the concept of electrification not just for transport but for heat for other other industries trying to push electrification into as many industries as possible and at the same time greening and and turning to renewables on the energy systems themselves that underpin uh, all of these electrified industry segments and at the same time, the the uh, the automobile uh, sector, the the uh, traditional automotive sector, had started to shift towards electric firmly. And I suppose in two thousand and eighteen, I always see the the final nail in the coffin of the of of, of the the potential that anything different could happen, like. Uh, you know, hydrogen getting a getting a run on EV when Ford and Volkswagen nailed their colours to the mast with a strong partnership and MOU between them that they were going to uh, co-develop um, on a lot of the the electric platforms that would underpin the uh, the EVs of the future and and that's really I think what has kickstarted what's happened in the subsequent years, particularly up until up until today. So at the same time, at home, what was the Irish government and, and ESB considering? So I suppose at the government level, um, in 2018, the government published their climate action plan um, as a subset of the national development plan for 20, uh, 2018 to 2027. And most people will have heard at some stage um, the, the uh, principle that the climate action plan is aiming to try and get a million EVs on Irish roads by 2030. Uh, quite an ambitious target, but it's that level of, of ambition that's really needed to try and push us towards the uh, the net zero targets and the the uh, the overarching climate action plan targets. So at the same time, ESB, we, we had obviously run the pilot project of the eCars network through 20, 2007 to 2017. Um, and we we knew that what we had was the bones and the the, the guts of a a commercialized a commercializable uh, business. Um, and I suppose what we were lacking maybe was the the additional structure that was needed to uh, to push forward. Uh, the backbone of that being actually monetizing our network. So um, as well as monet looking to monetize our network in 2018, we began formulating a plan um, that really set out how we were going to commercialize the network from the bottom up. Um, we heavily consulted the market. We spent a lot of time with the likes of the Irish EV Owners Association as, as key stakeholders. They understood maybe the gripes that they, were, they, they felt with our network, the issues that, that really bothered their drivers, and they were able to help us put a put a put a lens on it to understand what we needed to do to improve the user experience improve the customer experience so really we centered our our potential upgrade plan around kind of five core focus areas one range anxiety trying to get better coverage a bigger network over over bigger you know at a, at a closer interval so that people felt like they had the coverage to to go the distance um, increasing charger power levels. We had seen through, you know, through 2016 to 2018, 
um, the designs of EVs starting to ramp up in terms of charging capacity. So no longer were 22 kilowatt chargers, you know, the the the, the fastest um, things available, nor were, were were 50s. We now needed to start thinking about going to 150 kilowatts and, and even higher to to accommodate those those vehicles that could take that higher rate of charge. Um, so really looking at 150 kilowatt and above charging capacity. Um, and then the network availability and reliability really focusing on, you know, making sure that our network was performing at the highest possible standard um, and really reinvesting the, the money, the income that we would get from charging customers in improving the maintenance, improving the reliability and the availability of the network. Um, improving the concern around queuing anxiety because we were starting to see the roots of that in particular in, in kind of key arterial locations at specific times of the day where that one charger was that 150 kilowatt charger on a main M route was very busy at a particular time of day and some people were suffering a lot of, of lost time to, to queuing so focusing on putting multiple chargers at these locations and trying to create the ability so that when there was a bottleneck, it's relieved by having multiple chargers at those locations and other locations in close proximity. Um, and really to improve, improve the overall user confidence, a lot of focus on um, the, the experience of the customer in our mobile app and in the general use of our both the, the systems and the, the, I'll call it the, the, the UI side of things, the user interfaces, but also the actual physical hardware refining from what had been pilot hardware, pilot phase hardware through the 2007-17 range into uh, a narrowed volume of the, the right kind of kit that we felt was now leading the, the industry in terms of quality of build and engineering durability. So in 2018, the tail end of 2018, we actually had pulled together the guts of that business case and the Irish government launched the Climate Action Fund. Um, it was well geared for, for what we wanted in terms of the, the, the structure of the fund. So we applied to the Climate Action Fund for match funding. Uh, so that was 10 million from ESB match funded by the Climate Action Fund. And we secured that, so a 20 million investment in the network um, planned out over the subsequent five-year period from 2018 to 2023. So the CAF project, as we call it, the Climate Action Fund project um, in ESB has been ongoing since 2019. We started work in anger in 2019. Um, and it's it's in the closing phases, let's say, the, the final uh, tips of, of the icebergs are coming up as the, the, the last of our charging hubs are being built. Um, it was a phased, project in terms of the overall approach and really considering the customer first. We didn't want to implement pay to use on a network that was still pilot grade equipment. So while we implemented pay to use in 2019 to 2020 in that window, starting with our fast chargers in 2019 and then the AC standard chargers in 2020, we actually did a, a program of replacement works and upgrade works through 2019 to prepare for that. So we had already implemented change at the key locations across the country so that the user experience was a step change from what it was. Any of the kit that essentially on a on a on a performance and reliability perspective was was taken out, and any any of the kit that was categorically, you know, in need of replacement was done before we brought in pay to use. And then when pay to use was brought in, much to the much much of the support of, of EV drivers who saw it as a way of reducing, um, let's say, unnecessary use of the network. Um, we were able to then actually map out a plan for how that money was being reinvested as well as the the uh, the upgrade infrastructure or the up upgrade investment in infrastructure um overall that's improved the availability of the network we've raised uh, the the availability levels to 97 percent plus in that that window um, and that's continually improving as we we uh, we upgrade other other parts of the network but I suppose the the lion's share of the engineering in in all of the the climate action fund project has been on the new multi charger hubs that have been rolled out so I suppose the 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 core focus of that was for us to roll out multi charger hubs at locations with generally 150 kilowatt plus charging capacity um Essentially, those consist of a, a range of different sizes from two charger mini hubs with a 150 and a 50 kilowatt charger uh, up to four charger uh, 200 kilowatt hubs, um, 200 kilowatt by four um, with the capacity to cover up to eight vehicles.
Um, and those, I suppose, bigger hubs naturally have taken longer to build, to get planning permission, to execute. And I suppose they're the more interesting ones if you're an engineer, the more stressful ones if you're a commercial person waiting for, for these things to move along. Um, so I suppose just these are some of the high powered charging hubs that are now live across the island of Ireland. The first one that we actually commissioned um, two years ago was Junction 14 Mayfield um, on the M7. Um, we've recently commissioned a Barack Obama Plaza upgrade from a, a single charger, which uh, was very heavily used. It's now a four, four high powered hub. Um, and it's it's getting excellent use as well. A really welcomed addition to our network. Um, and I'll show a little video about that in a moment. Um, Kinagad Plaza, which uh, only went went live in the last few weeks, um, which is is also getting excellent use now, um, even only in, a, in the first couple of weeks. Um, and then Sleeve Rue, which is on the bottom right, which is down in Waterford, is just an example of one of our two uh, high powered hubs. So that's two by two hundred kilowatt chargers. Um, sometimes I can use the the, the 150, 200 kilowatt number um, bandied around, I suppose, just to explain a little bit about that. Um, if you were driving, for example, uh, an ID4, uh, VW ID4 or a Hyundai Ionic 5, and you were to pull into one of our um, high powered charging hubs with the 200 kilowatt chargers, um, typically you could go from 20 to 80% in somewhere between 25, 30 minutes, uh, depending on temperature, depending on the state of charge of your battery, depending on a, on a number of different factors, time of year is another factor. Um, but essentially, it's moved on so significantly from the days when you had to sit for an hour at a charger and potentially be in a queue. Um, so we've, we feel that we've added to the network in the right locations and are continuing to add to the network in the right locations. And we'll talk about the future in a moment as well. Um, so Barack Obama Plaza, I'll just quickly uh, play a little clip explaining what we've done there. We're here in Barack Obama Plaza today as part of our 20 million euro investment in EV charging infrastructure in Ireland. This is an important location for us. It's a strategic location. There's 160,000 drivers use this road every single day. So as part of our 20 million euro investment, we are going to build 56 high power charging hubs right across the country. They'll be strategically located on motorways and high traffic arteries right throughout the country. This is the type of thing that our members, when we talk about an EV association, are looking for. This is the bit that allows people to travel from city to city and, and it's, it's, it's a case of most people will charge at home but something like this is the bit where you go at the long weekend when you want to go visit somebody down the country or go on holidays this is the bit that really makes a difference and on top of that people who are a business people who travel for work are on the road regularly this is the sort of situation where they want to be able to come and charge so definitely I see it as a huge impact in terms of people being able to go and make the switch to an EV. This facility means a lot for EV drivers in Ireland. It means we're expanding our network and continue to expand our network and stay ahead of the EV demand. The demand for EVs nationally is growing, as we know, but also we've made a promise to our customers to always have a charge within 30 kilometers of your location. And that seeks to build on this promise. So uh, just just by way of kind of general headline um, information about that, so the the construction of other high powered hubs is is, is ongoing. Um, we have quite a quite a number that will be commissioned in uh, in the next eighteen months. In fact, quite a few that will be commissioned hopefully sooner than that. Um, keep watching the map for any of the EV drivers on here. Um, so. I suppose just in terms of uh, some of the kind of the technical challenges and um, I suppose it's, it's an important one for us. It was probably the key technical challenge um, when it came to deploying the high powered charging infrastructure. Um, essentially anything that needed to be connected to the medium voltage network, which for us was anything greater than a total demand of, of 200 kVA um, from the, the distribution network needed to connect above low voltage into the medium voltage network. Um, and in, in needing to be connected to the medium voltage network, we needed a substation. Um, so in practice, what that 
typically would mean is that you would need a block built traditional style substation um, akin to the one shown um, on the, the right hand side here. Typically 10 meters by five meters. This is the one that we actually built for Junction 14 as our, our first hub when we were still working through this, this initiative around compact substations. Um, typically a, a more complicated one for us commercially because we're trying to bring the landowner who's typically not ESB along um, on the on the, the, the process of, of allowing us to, to, uh, to have a substation built on the site specifically for the EV charging capacity. Um, it was becoming a real barrier for us to, to progress the, the high power charging hub element of the project. Um, and I suppose we worked uh, fairly aggressively with, with ESB networks, fairly tirelessly with ESB networks to come up with an alternative solution that would mitigate some of those problems. Um, so over the course of about a, a 12 month period, we managed to develop a specification and standard that was agreed with ESB networks um, for rollout of these compact substation solutions just shown on bottom right there. So you can see a lot smaller, a lot less uh, physically impactful in terms of its space. But there's other benefits as well, including the fact that naturally by it taking up less space, um, it's a little bit easier for us to negotiate a deal with our, with our, our, our host um, and actually be allowed in. They know that it's not a permanent, permanent fixture. So at the end of our lease, we, we take it with us. Um, and obviously we can also then recover some of the costs that otherwise might be sunk if we were to have to build a, a substation on the site. And just generally speaking, it's a cheaper solution. It, it's a lower cost solution for, for us when we're looking to build these sites. Um, still not cheap, but a solution that, that will get you onto the, onto the site in the first place. Um, it's, it's, now, uh, it's now being used on all of our medium voltage connected substations or uh, charging hubs um, and is a solution that uh, others are looking to use as well. So some of the other charge point operators who are installing infrastructure across Ireland will be using similar solutions. So I suppose that's that's one of the key the key solutions that we've we've worked on to try and debug the 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 challenges to, to public charging infrastructure expansion. So what does the the future look like? Um, so I suppose just at a global level, um, the trend is very clear on all fronts. Um, car sales globally continue in the the upward direction when it comes to EV. Um, Europe no different. Um, the penetration, the mass market penetration and adoption of EVs, obviously you've got Norway leading the pack, um, but, but ultimately you can see there that we're now seeing a tipping point whereby there's a tendency towards EV, um, even despite the, the higher cost of, of, of purchase of the vehicles, which is going to start to come down as more, uh, particularly uh, the, as they call it, the Asian invasion takes place with some of the, the, the lower cost um, Asian EVs coming into the, into the European market. Um, in terms of charging infrastructure, it continues to be a march towards a uh, rollout of more infrastructure in response to the perceived wave of EVs that is definitely coming. Um, the confidence is there for investment. Um, so now what we're seeing is, you know, globally, um, there's entities who are willing to invest big, big money in the charging infrastructure side of things, whether that be manufacturing, whether that be in the systems that underpin them, the charge point management systems and software solutions, or whether that be in charge point operators themselves um, and by association into utilities who are who are part of that, that uh, equation. Um, so, you know, naturally we're going to just keep that that let's say multifaceted attack happening as evs roll out more people drive evs there'll be more of a demand there'll be more ev charge point operators coming into the market we're seeing more competition in the irish market with more uh, more operators coming in not only from you know new startup entities but also entry by other uh, charge point operators from across europe and the uk I suppose considering what's happening in Ireland um, and some of the things that have happened more recently. So in 2000, sorry, in 2022, um, the Department for Transport established Zero Emissions Vehicles Ireland, uh, ZEVI, um, and that's really created a central, uh, let's say, policy uh, point within within government. Um, one of their first moves in the last uh, 12 months has been the drafting of and publication of an EV charging infrastructure strategy for the period 2022 to 2025. Um, and it sets out their strategy for, for charging infrastructure across all of the segments. So not just uh, public charging, but home charging, um, fleet charging, depot charging, destination charging, all of the various 
uh, aspects of how EV charging is likely to happen. Um, it sets out the various scenarios for the kind of infrastructure that might be needed, the quantities, the quantities of energy that will be needed for it, um, and really kind of maps out uh, a good baseline for the market itself to, to read what's required going forward. And then I suppose, how are we taking that and, and working with it? Um, as I've outlined before, beyond the Climate Action Fund project that we're closing out at the moment with the final bills of some of our, our, our uh, underdevelopment hubs, we have a, a, a strategy to continue to, to, to build out uh, beyond that. Um, so as I said, a network of up to 3,000 charge points um, and potentially more um, with a focus on high power charging. Um, so really en route, fast charging capability, multi-charging hubs. Um, the, the core focus will, uh, you know, essentially try to stay ahead of the forecast and stay, stay up there with the forecast and demand. Um, I suppose some of the other ancillary aspects of this will continue to place the customer at the center of that. And that will mean moving on with some of the ways that we provide our solutions to the customer. Um, for example, implementing contactless payment solutions on our chargers. Some of the more keen IDV drivers out there may have spotted our chargers and now uh, showing up the newer ones with, with contactless terminals, which we're working on on the, the both the technical and the commercial uh, solutions for, for implementing contactless payment. Um, new charging hardware. Hardware, it's a constantly moving target for, for us um, in the industry. Um, you've barely put a charger in the ground and there's a newer, better, glossier, fancier piece of kit available in the market. So it, we have to continue to, to try and maintain pace with that, that change and continue to look at what hardware is coming to the market and what hardware offers better solutions, um, as well as potentially innovative steps forward with the hardware. Um, so whether that be aspects of load management, um, so for example, having the capacity to spread the loads across multiple chargers. So if one vehicle is charging at a lower rate, it can shift the charge across to another vehicle. Again, that links into us continuing to look at the market in terms of hardware and what kit is best in class. Um, equally, things like canopies, um, it's always a, a sore point with EV drivers is why are there no canopies? It's a bit of a trade-off. We have to work with our hosts who are also on a journey who maybe are, are learning as, as, as they see the market take off that there's maybe value in them allowing us to put canopies in and seeing the potential value and considering potentially putting PV on these canopies. A few years ago, it was completely cost prohibitive, but the price of PV is coming down and solutions are becoming commercially available for good quality solar PV canopies to put over charging hubs. Um, so that is another aspect of, of our, our network that we're considering. And then I suppose the other is, is on-site battery storage. So potentially the capacity to um, essentially supplement uh, peak demands with batteries that are static sitting on the site, taking in that peak demand piece um, and having it in reserve for when there is that peak demand during a, a half hour, one hour window on, on a certain day in a certain week and having that predictive kind of capacity so that we can keep down the, the level of connection required from the distribution network for the charging infrastructure in the first place. So look, those are just some of the kind of the typical aspects of where, we, where we're going uh, pathway forward. Um, I'm really keen to move on to the, the questions and answers. I hope uh, there's been some value in me doing a, a little bit of a tour from the beginnings all the way through to now. I always find it, it helps gain context on maybe the challenges that have been overcome and the challenges that lie ahead. Um, so thank you. And uh, we'll maybe open up with the panel for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Paul. That was a very, um, very interesting um, uh, pre presentation that, that that you made there. Um, a lot, yeah, a lot of very interesting aspects. Things like, um, you know, the the horse manure. I find that quite interesting. The the requirement or the the change from horse manure to the to um, that 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 drove the transition to motor vehicles. And then now we're looking at the future um, as well to the transition to electric vehicles. So now we have the Q and A session. So um, and I would like to invite Emlyn to moderate the Q&A session. And just a reminder for anyone who does have any questions, please include them in the Q&A box. Yeah, thank you very much. Emlyn, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ian. And thanks, Paul, very much for a very informative lecture there. Um, Paul, I have a couple of questions here now. We have one here on grid capacity. And uh, if we uh, all go electric, will there be enough electricity to charge our EVs and still keep the lights on? <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's a very good question and it comes up quite a bit. Um, so I suppose Ireland is a bit of a, a bit of an interesting um, energy network. And while I'm not, I don't represent Airgrid, so I won't speak about uh, about the the, the broader um, long term capacity of the network. Um, the the general uh, let's say mood music around the capacity of of the electricity network to handle mass adoption of EVs is that actually the capacity at a at a gigawatt level is there that the, there won't be actually a shortfall in the the gigawatt capacity of the the uh, sorry of the the, the air grid the, the national network um so the the capacity in terms of generation and how that gets distributed around um. In practical terms, there is definitely going to be a continued need for investment in many aspects of, of the electrical uh, network. Um, probably the most significant will be in the ESP networks, low voltage network when it comes to residential in particular, because I suppose there is there is a, a an element of um, while we you know are still learning and, and, and finding our feet in the whole EV space, um, we're starting to see the roots of what I'd call the keeping up with the Joneses effect, where in one neighborhood, one person buys an EV and two weeks later, the whole row want to buy EVs. And now if that if that part of the LV network happened to be under any sort of strain, um, the ESP networks uh, planners are essentially having to try and uh, respond to it and get out ahead of it. So I do know that while it's not, while ESB Networks is obviously a separate part of, 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 of ESB, um, they have an, a team that's actively working on the, let's say, the predictive element of where the investments need to go to shoulder that capacity. Ironically, the public charging piece is probably the easier part because we we tend to come in at the medium voltage level. We create less of a, less of a kind of a, a lights going out potential risk and more of a, it just needs to be planned and executed in accordance with a, a good, clear plan. Um, so actually, for, for us, when it comes to public charging, less of a problem. And in fact, as I said before, um, you know what I think is really key to this is the, the smart meter side of things. As smart meters are rolled out and as the, the benefits of smart meters going for, forward are properly embedded in how the energy system works, actually, um, we're going to see the EVs become a critical part of a stable energy system as opposed to a disruptor. Um, and I think that's been widely accepted, not just in Ireland, but internationally as well. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, one here on emissions and real emissions. If the electricity used to charge EVs is created by burning fossil fuels, are there still uh, not a lot of emissions involved in driving an EV? <laughs> so um, I actually, I, I thought this one might come up. Uh, it often does and it gets, uh, it often gets uh, beaten over the head by, by uh, naysayers of EVs. So if you were to take the Irish network right now, um, and if you were to simply compare a petrol fueled, let's say Ford Focus standard 1.6 liter Ford Focus new model and compare it to the equivalent EV, a Nissan Leaf equivalent year, equi equivalent, uh, let's say horsepower, if you want, if you want to measure it in that way. Um, typically it's going to, the petrol engine is going to admit, emit twice as much um, in terms of grams of CO2 to the kilometer. Um, and that's with our current level of emissions from the energy sector in Ireland. So warts and all, um, the gas plant, the, the coal plant, the, the remnant plant, there are eventually going to be wound out of the energy uh, system in Ireland. So I suppose, you know, then you get into the, the broader question of, you know, beyond the the, let's say the, the tailpipe emissions of the vehicle and the energy fuel in and the question around the the uh, the impact the environmental impact of manufacture of the cars and really i suppose that gets into the the, the topic of international standards around uh, declare declaration of impact of the, the production of a car um, which there is now normalization of of those standards as well and, and essentially there's no escaping it for the car manufacturers in that respect um, so i think there's, there's good, strong evidence to say the, the fear that the emissions are just being moved from one pile to another is going away. And it goes back to that concept of get everything into electrification and then decarbonize electrification or the, the energy sector, essentially. Thanks, Paul. Um, I have one here on battery life. Um, I've heard that batteries in EVs need to be replaced after five years or so. 
as well as the cost, surely the waste batteries from EVs will generate huge amounts of hazardous landfill at the end of their life. Okay, so on the on the range side of things, um, <clears throat> it is true that there are some of the kind of the earlier uh, EVs that would have been kind of starting to find their way onto the, onto the road in 2007, 8, 9, 10. Um, that ultimately didn't have very good battery management systems. The technology behind how they were, were, were uh, let's say, operated wasn't really there yet. Um, and from a practical perspective, some of those would have maybe degraded to some extent to the point where maybe you'd have lost 20%. Some of the earlier Nissan Leafs maybe dropped 20% of their range, which was already pretty small in the first place. Um, but really what we've actually seen now is the, sh the step change, multiple step changes in the technology and the quality of the technology um, means that, you know, there, there are examples of, you know, of, of Teslas and Hyundais and you name them across the board that have passed, well surpassed the 500, 600, 700,000 kilometer mark with no change in their range. Um, and, and ultimately the batteries just keep on going. Even if we wind up in a position where there is a glut of vehicles that start to lose their, their range capacity, what we're now seeing is, is a real rush and I mean a real rush in investing in battery recycling, um, because ultimately those elements that went into those those batteries are still highly valuable. Um, and from a practical perspective, if you can uh, set yourself up with the, the right capacity to dismantle the batteries and recycle the elements, there's a serious amount of money to be to be uh, recouped from those uh, minerals that were bore out of mines or, or, or wherever. And ultimately, it's all part of the, the move towards a more circular economy as part of the same the same ecosystem. I don't think we're going to be throwing these cars off the off the edge of a cliff into a into a landfill anytime soon. Very good. Um, I want to hear uh, on uh, future-proof wireless vehicle charging has the potential to make both at-home and on-route charging more convenient and safe with cheap, uh, with cheap aftermarket kits available from next year. It would be a concern like what happened before with EV and infrastructure. Wired vehicle charging could quickly become obsolete and unused. Is this a serious consideration for the ESB? And just a little add-on that it this wireless charging is also available for HGVs and buses now. So have you thought about that, Paul? Yeah. So look, I suppose what we're what we're facing there is the the kind of the, the turmoil around, right, we need to get away from burning fossil fuels. What's the solution? And a few years ago, we were still caught in the kind of the toss up of is hydrogen going to come sweeping through here and solve all of our problems or is electrification the, the horse to back and the car manufacturers themselves um, were maybe having the existential crisis of we're not we're not quite sure um, Tesla have done a huge degree of uh, <laughs> of consolidating and solid solidifying the direction of travel and um, not just around the electrification side of things but essentially around the technology and the architecture that sits underneath it so like I mean for, for us as as energy suppliers and that's ultimately the backbone of what ESB is focused on is providing green clean energy to consumers in this case EV drivers if that means we have to you know if, if in five, 10, 15 years time, either a new cable connector standard comes along or wireless comes along. We move with the times. Um, we are keeping one eye on our, our the, 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 uh, the innovation team in ESB has one eye on, on this side of the industry at all times um, to see what's shifting and what's moving. But ultimately um, what won't change is that there is currently a, a trajectory on a, a unified path of the charging standard of CCS, the cable type, um, a unified approach to kind of the, the design of the charging infrastructure, the hubs, the port protocols for the, the infrastructure to communicate with each other and with systems centrally. Um, so actually what we're seeing is a normalization of what was essentially innovative mad space for, for 10 years in, internationally. We're now normalizing around this. There was actually a, a wireless charging project in ESB um, before my time, and they had the, the they had a, a re a, a butchered Nissan Leaf um, and a wireless charging pad, um, and there was lots of experimental testing done on it. I think it's probably more likely to become a solution that appears in home charging and in longer stay charging applications in the first uh, the first instance, because if anybody has ever lifted a heavy duty charging cable and connected it to 
a vehicle that can take it and an Ionic 5 or a, a, you know, a, a Porsche taken or one of them, that cable is seriously heavy. Think about the ener- the same volumes of energy going through a wireless charging pad. Um, it's going to be a while before we see it, uh, let's say, accepted. There are solutions in development and some of them even commercially available for heavy goods vehicles and for buses but it's going to be time it's going to take time before that finds its way into kind of a mainstream application uh, but at the end of the day electrons are electrons if it means we have to take out charger type a for charger type b we'll still be moving with that that uh, that focus so maintaining a focus on the market thanks paul a question here on the app um is it being considered for the eCar app to be able to display vehicle state of charge or energy consumed? It would really help users gauge when vehicles are likely to be finished charging. So I'm thinking probably that's probably someone that if you're pulling up to charger, you can see what the car ahead of you, how close that it might be. I'd, I'd say that's probably what that's getting at. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose this is where... Um... It's it's a really interesting space if you're if your IT background um, <laughs> or if or if you're into that sort of thing is that essentially what we're seeing now is the collision of um, you know the the heavy energy uh, application of EV charging and at the same time the 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 end user interfaces and the intelligent software systems um, back when back when uh, the the e cars network in Ireland was essentially a, a pilot project we were involved and a couple of the the, the main main guys are still with us and um, who are involved in the development of what's called the open charge point protocol which is actually the comms protocol for chargers back with the, the kind of the central system and then the bi-directional functionality of the two um, that has gone from basic fun you know rudimentary development all the way through now and it has global buy-in as the standard and is continuously being revised that standard is trying to take in multiple hardware manufacturers and multiple system providers under one standard communication protocol um, and it's that communication protocol to, to not actually be able to to explain it fully uh, technically is probably a good thing <laughs> is is probably the big barrier is to have that level of information communicating back and forward between the charger in the field back into a central system and back out to the consumer on their mobile phone so they can see what's happening um i think it'll happen with time as the the hardware and the the, the systems become you know evolved from where they are at the moment and as more and more investment happens in the space um i suppose we're 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 using what we feel is best in class uh, back back office systems which is provided by a company called drives um and and ultimately uh, that system is, is something that we're constantly working with the provider to look at where they're innovating look at what they're adding looking for new new systems and applicate you know functional features of their their platform to to move it on um, so not a current feature but one that we'll be keeping an eye on what we can achieve um, to try and keep providing more to the customer. Thanks, Paul. Um, another question here, Paul. And currently, the overall EV cost is a big inhibitor to mass EV ownership in Ireland. How do you see hardware and running costs going between now and 2030? And do you see any potential issue with regard to the recycling of spent EV batteries? Okay, well, look, I'll start in reverse order. I think I covered the the uh, the, the spent EV batteries question. I think you know over over time, and and I think. The, the other key thing on the spent EV battery side of things is like, you know, European law is shifting in a direction that it's going to make it harder and harder for the manufacturer to sell the car to you without a guarantee that they might take it back. And actually that's being encouraged now by a few of the other manufacturers who are committing to and accepting that they'll they'll take full responsibility, even if it's 20 years from now, to take that vehicle back and dispose of it safely and cleanly. So I don't think, I think once we reach a normalized approach in the in the ev industry it'll have moved forward um your other question sorry i'm playing playing catch up here um in relation to the cost of the hardware um, and the running costs between now and 2030 okay so in terms of costs of the hardware and costs of the uh, the running of the infrastructure i suppose i'll come at this from the perspective of public charging infrastructure um there's no there's no shying away from the fact that it isn't the cheapest thing to deliver but ultimately it's it's a high grade heavy uh, energy application we're moving away from the world where it was a single 50 kilowatt charger in the corner of the local tesco to now looking for four six twelve eighteen twenty high-powered chargers all capable of 150 to 350 kilowatt charging 
and when you are looking to put that onto a site you then have to actually ask yourself how big is the connection coming into the site so you're not you're not dealing with you know small connections it's 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 heavy heavy grade applications but i suppose for us the key really is working with both the the, the perspective of the consumer so taking in the perspectives of the ev drivers taking in the the thought process behind what the the, the state wants what Department for Transport are planning, what TII are planning in terms of how they want to see charging of, of vehicles and not just not just private cars, but heavy goods vehicles, buses and other 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 potential loads um, and working with the prospective hosts, because for us, one of the key things is we need partners, we need, you know, motorway service areas, retail parks, shopping centers, et cetera, to work with us um, to, to find a way to to deploy these these solutions uh, together. Um, so, I mean, the costs are obviously high, but we work on the basis of, you know, very much underpinned by the ESB mindset of we're not investing in this for, for flipping it. We're investing in this for the long long haul. So if that means us having to invest with a 20-year, 20 25-, 30-year horizon around what that infrastructure is going to be used for and keeping in mind that there might need to be a flexibility about if the standards change or if the type of charger needs to be updated or if the spaces need to be reconfigured to accommodate new vehicles, that we do that and we work with the hosts to try and achieve that. So... Yes, relatively high costs involved, but what we're seeing now is, compared to five years ago, we now know that electrification of transport is real. It's not a uh, flash in the pan. When I moved from, from the generation business, dare I say it, there was people looking at me going, you're mad. But five years on, we're in a real market with real shift in a very specific direction, which is upward. So as long as there's that opportunity, there'll be investment. Thanks, Paul. Uh, one, I think you touched on something of this before, but um, a question here. Is it likely we will see the Zap Pay app extend to Ireland where it would have a single app to enable charging payment across the different CPOs or even across UK and Ireland and maybe even Europe? So well, I won't dwell on that one. The answer is yes, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, a question now on the uh, up to many KVA, can the compact substations deliver? Okay, so they're they're relatively flexible in that it's a I suppose it's a concept, um, and we have a range of specifications depending on on what we're what we're trying to achieve. Um, there is a lim an upper limit to it. I don't I'm a mechanical engineer, not electrical, so, so this is where I back away from it. Um, there is an upper threshold. I don't know what it is off the top of my head when you get pushed into now we're into proper built built substation solution. But if you're moving into that space, you're talking about a a super hub with 20, 30 high power chargers and you're going in there for a long time. So you are you don't mind having to spend the money on a, on a block built structure and a, a fairly permanent arrangement on the site. You're, you're kind of going all in. <laughs> well, I, I'll just, I see a question down here further on. So I go to that. EV numbers are planning to grow tenfold by 2030. Are you considering mega charging stations with 10 to 20 to 30 charging stations like you're starting to appear in the UK? So... Is that something we're seeing or considering so? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I can't give anything away in terms of definitive pathway forward for us with, with specific locations or anything like that, but it is on our on our roadmap. Um, you know, from a practical perspective, we try to take a very pragmatic view, which is if we can do, you know, uh, scalable deployments, um, then we will. So that might, it might be a case of rather than going in, you know, knee deep uh, week one and have, you know, 50 chargers on a site that are sitting idle for a long time. We try and look at it from the point of view of phase deployment, but we are very serious about multi-charger deployments. And I suppose how things have changed in the last five years as we've gone from, or in the last 10 years as we've gone from, look, it, there might be the odd EV that needs to swing in here and grab a charge to actually we might have a situation where there's queuing to, we're seeing it in other markets. Um, I spend, I've spent probably uh, half of my time um, over the last five years working on the UK market. I'm more focused on the Irish market now and we I've I've watched it happen in the UK. It went, you know, they're probably a two year march ahead when it comes to the let's say the infrastructure implementation in that they have more market players, they have more direct investment coming in from the private sector in building these sorts of hubs. Um, and I think what we'll see as being the, the tipping point is when you start to see 
um, you know, a, a move by by some of the, the motorway service areas and petrol forecourt operators in doing their own thing. And that's the sure indicator that not only is it a case of there's a market, but there's an, uh, sorry, a rising market. There's also a declining market on the other side of the fence um, and a kind of a, a shift to try and keep pace. So uh, we'll, we'll see as, as things pan out. But yes, larger hubs, they'll keep coming um, and we'll be, we'll be working in that direction. Um, question here. And if we had eight cars were charging at one of the four by 200 kilowatt charging station, does that mean that each EV could draw a maximum of 100 kilowatts? So, yes. So the, the, yeah. the current the current chargers that we have installed at those four charger hubs are uh, they, they split the load between the two vehicles that are connected. So if you're in a vehicle that can take 200 kilowatts, you could get up to 200 kilowatts from that from that charger. Um, what I, from personal experience, have seen having driven my own EV in mainland Europe in the middle of a heat wave is that I don't think we'll ever have climate cl climate change aside temperatures in Ireland that will get you up to <laughs> the upper end of that range. But essentially, yeah, it, it splits between the between the two. Um, now, we'll, as I said, we'll continue monitoring the market at the moment. The hardware we're using is, is 200 kilowatt uh, rated equipment, but we will be looking at, at other options and we continue to look at other options um, for higher power, le power levels and also split power levels. So the idea of having kind of a central power kiosk that distributes so you could have one that's able to pull a full-blown 350 kilowatt charge if there's some crazy vehicle that can take it um, and at the same time have the 10 year old Nissan Leaf at the other end taking its maximum 45 kilowatts and the two can live happily in the same environment uh, so new solutions coming all the time yeah um how are you for time there Paul we maybe might take one more maybe and we yeah, can sure. maybe wrap it up by that um I have an interesting one here. Can ESB customer provide a charger to the public? Can an ESB customer provide a charger? Oh, someone wondering, can we provide, a, uh, can an ESB customer provide a charger to the public? There's no plans on, uh, let's say, the public opening up their own private chargers. I wonder, is that... that Not at the maybe? moment, no. no. Now, that being said... Um... If the if the if the if the questioner wants to get in touch, by all means get drop drop an email to uh, to the eCars contact center. It'll find its way through to me. If you have a location, um, I didn't think I'd be doing a sales pitch on this, but if you have a location, <laughs> anybody on the call who has a location that they think would be good for a public charger, give me a good you know drop drop us an email. It falls on my desk anyway, and really like my day to day bread and butter is trying to move those opportunities forward, assess them, take them forward potentially for, for, for uh, business cases and, and look to look to add them to the queue of, of rollout, you know. Well, maybe after giving you an opportunity for the plug, we lend it so that's how we will, Paul. <laughs> excellent, excellent, Emily. Thank you very much. Great. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for the uh, the, the questions. Uh, a lot of great questions there. I suppose just before we conclude, uh, Paul, if um, if someone does want to uh, contact you, so you mentioned there, um, you're 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 inviting um, if anyone has any questions. Uh, how what's the best way for them to contact you? What's your what's the best email for them to contact you on? Yeah, so probably the probably the easiest way to to get in touch would be actually through the. Um through the eCars uh, contact center. So it's simply eCars at ESB.ie. And uh, that's all one word, E-C-A-R-S at ESB.ie. Um, and if, 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 that, uh, if that comes through with my, my name on it, it'll, it'll land on my desk. <laughs> that's perfect. Well, Paul, thank you very much for, um, for, for your presentation and thank you for taking the, uh, the questions and answers. So very engaging. So thank you very much for that. Thank so you, that guys. Uh, 